Hundreds of residents in a village in Uganda are homeless after government set fire to more than 100 grass thatch roofs. Ugandan officials allege that the attackers were from South Sudan. The border village is in an area claimed by both South Sudan and Uganda. Catherine Nambi reports from Kampala. The gunmen raided the village in Uganda's Moyo district. The attackers said the Ugandan residents were farming on South Sudan land. Livestock, food, mobile phones and money were looted from residents who fled for their safety. Moyo District Chairman Williams Anyama says during the attack houses were torched so the people now are sleeping in the cold. He notes that Ugandans retaliated. They burnt off more than 50 houses and in retaliation the Ugandans also burnt 20 houses belonging to South Sudanese residents. So the situation is very bad. There are over, as I speak, there are over 400 people who are displaced. They have nothing to eat they, because they were running away from hostilities. So they did not carry most of their basic needs, including food. The residents have taken shelter at the Uganda People's Defense Forces or UPDF detachment. Laila Angushia is one of the residents who fled with her family. She says they are confused about which country controls the land. I'm here, a farmer. We are here with our children. We sit in that land and we are planting our crops. We get food. We get money for sponsoring our children for education. Our bill to the government is to help us and to tell us the truth. Resident Swali Aikomundu wants the two governments to demarcate the border to provide a permanent solution to recurring disputes. If the place is in Sudan, let the government say that the place is in Sudan. If it's a Uganda place, let the government also tell us that it's a Uganda. So if the place is in Sudan. Goa Goffin is the Moyo District Resident District Commissioner. He says Ugandan officials are trying to speak with the South Sudan counterparts to ensure the perpetrators of the attack are brought to book as they also ponder on border demarcation, which is long overdue. This incident is not orchestrated by the South Sudan army. It is by youth. We are in good relationships and collaboration with our South Sudan leadership to ensure that we recover everything. And we have agreed to have a bilateral meeting uh, between Uganda and leadership this side along the border with the South Sudan in Kajukaji. I want to ask for calm. He says the security forces from the two countries have deployed in the disputed area to prevent further clashes. South Sudan's government spokesperson, Michael McQuay, told VOA he wasn't aware of the attack or allegations South Sudanese were responsible. Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni and South Sudan's President Salva Kiir have discussed the issue in the past and agreed the border communities can till the farmland without either nation claiming ownership until a demarcation is done. However, disputes over the land have continued among communities and there are no signs that the demarcation is to be done soon. This is Catherine Nambi for VOA News in Kampala. At least 13.4 million babies were born prematurely in 2020. This is according to a report by the World Health Organization and other United Nations partners that says one in 10 infants were born before 37 weeks of pregnancy. Marine Ojiambo reports. Preterm birth is the single largest killer of children under the age of five, accounting for more than one in three of all deaths within the first month of life. Globally, one preterm baby is born every two seconds. In a report released yesterday by the World Health Organization, nearly one million newborns died due to complications of preterm birth, while millions more survive with disabilities that many live with throughout their lives. The WHO's director for the Department of Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health and Aging, Anshu Banaje, says action is needed urgently to prevent preterm birth and improve care for affected babies and mothers. We need to reorient our health system much more to a primary health care approach. That means that uh, we know that 80 to 90 percent of our interventions can be delivered at the primary health care level. And, um, and so that shift to make sure that services are coming closer to the people. Uh, we know that equity is a large issue. Uh, for example, there's not only an issue between equity between countries, but even in countries. We have inequities in between rural areas, urban areas. 
Although preterm babies now have better chances of survival in many parts of the world, there is no improvement in the rates of such births over the past decade. The survival rate is equated to social status as preterm babies born to rich families tend to survive compared to those born in poor families in Africa. Most preterm babies die from lack of needed care. Joy Lohn is a researcher and professor of maternal reproductive and child health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So Africa, 4 million babies born too soon each year. The rates are higher than uh, Europe, but actually just slightly lower than South Asia. So the big difference for Africa is the survival. So for babies who are born too soon in Africa, they die too soon. And this should not be acceptable. Most of the child deliveries in sub-Saharan Africa happen in lower-level healthcare facilities. Nahia Salim is a senior lecturer and researcher at the Department of Pediatric and Child Health at Mohimbili University of Health and Allied Sciences in Tanzania. She says survival of the newborn babies is complex in sub-Saharan Africa despite government investments in healthcare. We understand that our health system is still weak in most of our sub-Saharan Africans. And uh, NES360, in collaboration with WHO and UNICEF, has just launched uh, an implementation toolkit to support countries to implement in a smarter way. And how can this be happening is to strengthen our health system building blocks, harmonize our partners to work together, uh, through strengthening the newborn care in, at all levels. The WHO says maternal health risks such as adolescence pregnancy and high blood pressure disorder during pregnancy preeclampsia are closely linked to preterm births. Banaja, however, says mental health is also one of the causes of preterm and stillbirths in mothers. We certainly know also that mental anxiety, depression, is obviously related to preterm birth. Many of us have published on, on this, and it's a clear line on this. We need to improve there. And this quality care that we have been talking about here for on, on both sides of, of uh, the mother and baby and three them together, it's so important, and, and also to, in a situation with stillbirth. The World Health Organization says the report on preterm babies urges the implementation of known and cost-effective solutions to ensure that every woman has access to high-quality sexual, reproductive, and maternal care, and every baby born too soon can survive and thrive. Reporting for VOS Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Jambo in Sacramento, California. As South Africa's electricity problems deepen, Power cuts have left most traffic lights dark with frustrated motorists stuck in long traffic jams. Homeless and unemployed people have taken over almost all major road intersections in Johannesburg where they control traffic for a few coins in return. Tuso Kumalo reports from Johannesburg. The impact of increasing power cuts in South Africa depends each day. The blackouts have rendered traffic lights useless causing chaos on the roads, especially mornings and evenings. Homeless and unemployed people have stepped in to help control traffic at busy intersections. Dobego Bangada is among the many living on the streets of Johannesburg. He decided to control traffic at a busy intersection near the suburb of Santin because drivers are grateful. I'm looking something to eat. Yeah. Sometimes I give me something, even just uh, two rand, five rand. I'm going looking for a job somewhere. If I didn't find a job, I can't just ask me the money. Everything you can do for me. South Africa's unemployment rate tops 33%. 33-year-old Johnson Molaise lost his job in 2019. When the power cuts heightened, the father of three decided to help motorists at a busy traffic light in Randpark Ridge in Johannesburg. In return, he says, drivers leave him a little cash and goodies. You know the pain that uh, one goes through when you've got nothing to put on the table or to feed your family. And, um, you know, you need to go out there trying to help the people, you know, try to ease the frustration, the stress and all that. But it's not much, at least when... The sunset, you've got something, bread, you know, times are tough. Musa Serokwe is one of many motorists who are grateful to Malaise and his colleagues at the lights. These people have decided to stand up for the nation. 
they are really helping us. We really appreciate the good job that they are doing to us. They really deserve something. Can the government at least realize what they are doing? Authorities, however, are not impressed. Johannesburg Metropolis spokesperson Colani Fitler told journalists the unauthorized traffic controllers are not welcome as they endanger their own lives and those of motorists. It is commendable uh, to a certain point, but we do know that if an accident does happen whilst they are controlling traffic, then the city won't be liable and it will be at the cost of the motorists. So uh, it is important that uh, if you do come across that type of situation as a motorist, please uh, do call uh, the Johannesburg Metropolitan Police Department and officers are sent to uh, remove those people and to help alleviate congestion if there is congestion. But the traffic controllers say as long as the government does not bring a solution to both the unemployment and electricity crisis, they will continue helping motorists even if it means they might be arrested. Reporting for VOA News in Johannesburg, I am Tusokumalo. In Nigeria, the president of the Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People, also known as Mossab, says the group is disappointed with the ruling by the United Kingdom Supreme Court on Wednesday in favor of Shell Oil and Gas Company. The court said that it was too late for Nigerian plaintiffs to sue Shell's two subsidiaries over a 2011 oil spill of the coast of the country's Niger Delta region. Another court ruling in 2021 ordered Shell to pay $111.6 million dollars to the Ijama Ibubu community in Nigeria's River State for polluting their farmlands. Mossop President Figalo Unsuke tells me that while the British courts provided some hope for Shell to be held accountable for polluting the Niger Delta, Wednesday's ruling is a setback for the effort. It's quite an unfortunate situation that um, corporations will commit huge damages and um, we are unable to hold them accountable because of limitations of the law. But the thing I think is that um, societies should be able to find a way to hold corporations who commit monumental damages to the environment to account. Because at the end of the day, you see that when the land is completely destroyed, the people's future is completely destroyed. So in some way, we should be able to make local laws that can force corporations to at least remediate the land, even if they won't be held accountable in some way, like in this case, due to the fact that there were delays in going to court. I think this is a huge setback for us and for us, our effort to get Shell to be held accountable for all of the damages it has done in our land. It's not transparent and we don't have confidence in the entire process because the community is kept away from the entire thing. Fegalo, um, Shell Oil says that now the British Supreme Court ruling should bring to an end all legal claims in English courts related to spill in the Niger Delta area. Yes, the judgment is victory for Shell and pain for the people. And it's quite unfortunate. It's quite unfortunate because um, the British courts actually provided some hope for Shell to be held accountable for its crimes. But obviously, the judgment has closed that chapter. The community in the Niger Delta region, plus the Nigerian government, there have been efforts to at least bring to account those responsible for oil spill in the region. What is the latest now besides this court ruling in terms of the the dealing with the Nigerian government, including even cleaning up the region? It is a growing awareness which, of course, became popularized by the cancer that we were led um, struggle in the Niger Delta here in Nigeria. I think that there will be increasingly more agitation to get Shell and other companies who commit these crimes to be held accountable for whatever damages they do cause. I think that all of that will mean some responsibility on the part of the company. The point is that um, Shell continues to be sneaky in its activities. So, for example, if you look at the United report on Ogoni, the report itself was based on less than 30% of polluted sites in Ogoni. And that report was sponsored by Shell. So you now see that even a scientific study that they did on Ogoni, they hid Shell's crime in Ogoni by not accounting for about 150 oil spill sites that are in Ogoni. Those sites were not captured in the UN report. So you see that the oil companies are still taking advantage of certain loopholes that do exist in Nigeria. 
And we do hope that gradually as this agitation continues, we do hope that some of these things will be corrected and that we can make society better. Okay, thank you so much, Pegalo. Nice to talk with you. Thank you, bye bye. Figala Unsuke is the president of the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people, also known as Mossap. He was speaking with us from Bori in Ogoni land. Let's give a shout out this morning to our affiliate, Alternative Youth Radio in Monrovia, Liberia, which is dedicating a state of the art media complex today, Thursday, in Monrovia. James Quabo is the 2019 Mandela Washington Fellowship graduate and founder of Alternative Youth Radio. Liberia's first youth-oriented radio. Kwabo is a Mandela Fellow, part of the Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders, the flagship program for the U.S. government's Young African Leaders Initiative, also known as YALE. Kwabo tells me that the complex and the alternative youth radio are a fulfillment of a pledge he made as a Mandela Fellow to transform his radio station into a media network. As a 2019 Mandela Washington Fellow, of the U.S. State Department, I see this as a fulfillment of a pledge that we made uh, during our departure from uh, Liberia to the U.S. so that uh, when we come back, we'll be able to transform our current alternative news radio into a media complex where we embarked on a training of young people in rural Liberia and creating access to information and employment opportunities for young people based in rural Liberia. So you own or you run Alternative Youth Radio. What type of programming do you do? Well, uh, basically, as the name implies, we are into uh, youth advocacy and youth empowerment. So our programs are tied to the issue of creating access to uh, information concerning youth development, youth empowerment, and also community support. So how can the young people advocate for their rights? How can young people have a platform to speak to their local leaders? How can young people have the access and opportunity to explore more programs, production avenues? And so what we've been able to do specifically since 2016, we embarked on this uh, vision. We have been able to train around 30 young people. And currently we have in our employ about 15 young people from rural Liberia, precisely Zorzo, local county. And these young people are taken to the airwaves to talk about the youth manifesto because we are going to election in 2023. So we're beginning to tell out our programs on how these national actors or the politicians seeking elected positions can respond to our manifesto as young people. And also how can we bring, because um, the U.S. also mentioned that uh, there are 1.5 billion young people below 18 years. So this means we have a huge population. We check Liberia. 65% of those who make up the population are young people. So it means that we are we are agents of change and we must begin to have a platform that will speak to those specific issues about health, about education, about youth uh, entrepreneurship and several others. You mentioned the experience. You are an alumna of the Mandela Washington Fellowship. Yes, correct. And what type of lessons do you think this program has taught you? What the program has taught me to be selfless when it comes to leadership. And I feel that this is important in every leadership. Before I went to the U.S., I was a leader, but I went to the U.S. I uh, doing this training. It has opened my scope of looking at things from a broader perspective in terms of the interest of those we serve. And it has taught me the essence of being able to volunteer and to mobilize community resources. I can tell you for free, uh, Mr. Button, what we've been able to do with this youth development initiative this is a work of forty thousand United States dollars. I can tell you that through the support of the community, we've been able to raise resources from the local community, the local bank. Mr. Kwabo, congratulations on your media complex and uh, wish you all the best, you know, in carrying on your work. Thank you so much for speaking with us. I appreciate you very much and thanks to the VOA. I will try also to just inform you that uh, we partners to the VOA. We continue to lead your, your useful programs, especially with uh, your program, They Break Africa. James Quabo is a 2019 Mandela Washington Fellowship graduate. He is also founder of Alternative Youth Radio, Liberia First Youth Radio. 